In 1938, as the FCC began to look into the business practices of CBS and NBC, they acquired a new chairman, James Lawrence Fly. He was an ardent supporter of Roosevelt's New Deal philosophy. By 1938, Roosevelt was no longer pursuing relief programs that relied on cooperation with big business. In the president's eyes, big business had undermined the National Recovery Act. The second wave of New Deal programs were designed to combat corporate monopolies. In Fly's view, NBC and CBS were trying to monopolize control of the nation's radio stations. By 1938, NBC had 154 affiliates. 23 stations were directly affiliated with the Red Network, flagship by WEAF. 24 stations were directly affiliated with the Blue Network, flagship by WJZ, both in New York. The remaining 107 affiliates could air programs from both networks. WEAF New York. Between the two, the Red Network operated more of the high-power clear channel stations. WEAF had originally been part of AT&T's pre-RCA merger chain. WJZ began as part of Westinghouse and had largely used free talent. During the 1930s, NBC Blue did carry some well-known five- and six-day-a-week serialized dramas, including Vic and Sade, Clara Lou and M, Betty and Bob, and Little Orphan Annie. It's Blood Barbie. It sure is. And here he comes. We don't want to be running like this. He might get excited and not know us. Stop, Joe. Stop. All right. But the Red Network had the most powerful stations and strong popular programming. Many sponsors insisted on placing their programs on NBC Red. Although NBC Blue had some popular sponsored shows, its schedule consisted largely of network-sustained news, public affairs and talk programs, concerts by Arturo Toscanini's NBC Symphony Orchestra, and rural AIM programs like the National Farm and Home Hour. New programs often made their debut on NBC Blue and were moved to NBC Red when they became popular because the Red Network stations carried about three-fourths of NBC's commercial programs Industry observers commented that NBC, from 1927 until 1943, used the Blue Network more as a foil than an all-out competitor. In May of 1940, after a three-year investigation, the FCC issued a scathing report on chain broadcasting. Chain broadcasting is the act of connecting two or more radio stations of a broadcast network to broadcast the same program at the same time. The report attacked the affiliation policies of NBC and CBS, as well as the talent booking agency practices. It concluded that the extent of control exercised by the two major networks over the entire radio industry was not in the public interest. The report proposed limiting each network to one affiliated station per city and limiting one network per company, which would have had a direct impact on NBC's dual network ownership. By that year, mutual broadcasting was already on par with the industry leaders in terms of their affiliate roster size. Still, because mutual affiliates were mostly in small markets, or lesser stations in large ones, the network lagged behind in advertising revenue. In 1940, NBC took in 11 times as much advertising profits as mutual. NBC and CBS argued that their overhead cost was also much higher. In 1940, MBS employed just 72 people, while CBS employed 1,900 and NBC 4,600. Mutual's cumulative billing for the first eight months of 1940 was slightly less than $2.5 million. CBS's in that time was roughly $25.8 million, and NBC's was $31 million. Mutual argued as a cooperative they were being blocked by NBC and CBS's corporate structure. Perhaps none of the networks were being completely transparent. The January 1st, 1941 issue of Broadcasting Magazine noted that in Greater New York during the previous October and November, WOR and its 135,000 watt transmitter held five of the top six rated 15 minute daily serial programs. WOR was the Mutual Broadcasting System's flagship station. 
That same issue contained a spread ad taken out by RCA, touting the advertisement revenue growth of the Blue Network. NBC had sensed the coming litigation and had begun to divest themselves from the Blue Network, splitting off their advertising and sales departments from the Red. The magazine predicted another boom year for the radio industry. In May of 1941, the FCC issued formal rules to break up what it perceived to be monopolies in radio. Its main desire was to get NBC to sell one of its networks. It also wanted to ensure that both CBS and NBC couldn't operate multiple stations in the same city. There was good reason for the FCC's concern. On Friday, September 12, 1941, a comedy variety program called Ballantine Beer's Three Ring Time began on Mutual. Three Ring Time was the network's first program to originate from the West Coast, designed to make Mutual a true competitor in national non-sports-related broadcasting. Within Mutual, hopes for the program rested on the unlikely starring tandem of Charles Lawton, Milton Berle, and singer Shirley Ross. Of the 77 coast-to-coast -coast Mutual affiliates to carry the program, 14 of them were in cities served by less than four full-time stations, i.e., less than enough to allow Mutual, CBS, and both NBC networks one outlet apiece. This meant the networks had to share time on these stations. All 14 of the stations were NBC affiliates on five-year contracts. Mutual could air programs on these affiliates, but NBC had a 28-day option to take over any time slot it chose. Not only that, it could air programs associated with other networks. NBC quickly exercised the option on 10 of the 14 stations for the half hour when Three Ring Time was airing. Shortly after, NBC also announced that it would carry Three Ring Time on some of its stations. By December, six of the 10 stations on which the program had started for Mutual were among those carrying it for NBC Blue. NBC effectively stole Mutual's program and put Three Ring Time on its secondary network. In 1941, NBC and CBS controlled 50 of the country's 52 clear channel stations. They had at their disposal 85% of the nighttime radio power available. Because they held dominant contracts with these stations, they were without any full-time competition in 45 cities with populations of 50,000 or more. Mutual was left out in the cold. The week after Three Ring Time first aired, anti-monopoly hearings began in Washington, D.C. By December, NBC and CBS had managed to assert that although they made a ton of money, they were also spending $8 million a year on sustaining programs. The FCC observed that NBC had utilized the Blue Network to block competition from CBS and Mutual, giving its Red Network an unfair advantage. Because Mutual was a cooperative network established years after NBC and CBS entrenched themselves, it was excluded from, or only lamely admitted, to many important markets. But the FCC's proposed regulations were sweeping and revolutionary. The new rules wouldn't have been as simple as breaking up a monopoly. It would have required that no station anywhere in the U.S. be linked by an option contract to one network. On the face of it, no chain broadcasting would mean no NBC and no CBS. Ruling in favor of this breakup could prevent any centrally controlled network from forming within the radio industry. It would have sent radio back to the chaotic years of the 1910s. Appeals were filed, but the Christmas and Hanukkah holidays were coming. It was thought by the experts that hearings could stretch into the new year. <laughs> 